Today, we consider having to tell a smelly roommate that they need a swipe of their deodorant, a discreet and, well, incredibly awkward conversation. Even the idea, maybe this is just me, that someone would gift you a stick of deodorant at a birthday party to be the stuff of literal nightmares. However, traveling back in time, just 400 years ago, can take us to an image of one of England's most powerful monarchs as she sits on a throne and more than 70 of her court members lavishly gift her with the early modern equivalent of deodorant as a thank you for her New Year celebrations in 1562. Now, ironically, this was not a passive-aggressive hint towards a queen who was believed to bathe only once a month to as infrequently as four times a year. Gross, I know. But it was, weirdly enough, a gift of high cultural significance that reflected a wish for good health and pious nature and would have brought great joy to both a thoughtful noble and a grateful Elizabeth. This was because early modern deodorant, more often known as sweet purses, was actually seen as a hot cultural item that sought to answer many problems and questions within Eliz early modern English society. Involving post-Reformation theology, the beginnings of early modern neuroscience, and Elizabethan court culture. Now, sweet purses didn't look like our modern Dove or Old Spice. They were usually made out of a silk or linen lining and heavily embroidered exteriors. These purses were meant to be eye-catching and decadent, as they were made with highly, in color, highly colored embroidery, glass beads, and silver and gold gilded threads. They were also filled with rich herbs and spices that would waft through the air as they hung from one's neck or waist. Unfortunately, not very many sweet purses survive today, but those that remain have maintained that decadent, eye-catching nature. Now, with a turn towards post-Reformation theology taking hold in England, a really heavy question settled into the minds of these people. What can influence the good-naturedness of my soul and therefore the closeness I can have with God, and how do I best control this idea? There were some principles in post-Reformation thought that gave early modern English people some guidance in this question, as it promoted an emphasis on qualities like modesty and charity, a meditation on holy images, and the idea that what one consumed through their senses could impact their imagination. Early modern English people then became obsessed with understanding all the ways that they could perceive stimuli or consume matter. This was all in an attempt to make themselves closer to God. This question of influence led to the acceptance of two main ideas, imagination and humoral theory. Imagination theory was the idea that what one consumed through their five senses could impact their imagination. While we understand imagination to be a figment or intangible part of our psyche, to the early modern English person, it was a physical part of their brain. See, they believed that the brain was broken up into six components, five ventricles and a connector piece. These ventricles were known as the common sense, the imagination, the estimation, the cogitation, the worm, and the memory. That connector piece was known as the worm that connected the cogitation to the memory. According to imagination theory, the body would take in stimuli from all of its senses and form images in the first ventricle of the brain, the common sense. Unfortunately, the common sense ventricle was very watery and most images weren't believed to stick. However, if they did stick, they would then be passed on to the second ventricle, the imagination. Now, in the imagination ventricle is where the images that have been perceived by the brain are going to get copy, cut, and paste to form new ideas in the estimation. In the estimation, it's going to reconfigure these ideas in any number of wild combinations. Both the imagination and the estimation ventricle are what really concerned early modern English people, as it was where they understood that what the body had, had perceived was going to be manipulated by the brain. Now, those new ideas and those new images were then going to be brought into the cogitation, which is where they thought the soul was kept. This was where they also believed that they would form worldviews and make decisions about life, so that all of that information 
and what created a person's temperament would be stored in the memory. Now, I <laughs> do understand that's quite a bit of early modern neuroscience to throw at you all, so I'm going to hopefully recenter ourselves in a bit of a more modern context. I give for you the example of a TikTok for you page. If every day you opened up your TikTok and you're watching different videos about cute little puppies or people trying on sun hats under rainbows, your brain would take in the images of puppies, sun hats, and rainbows in through the common sense ventricle to then be selected and copy, cut, and paste by the imagination ventricle. Now taking those elements and bringing them into the estimation, the brain's going to reconfigure them in any number of wild combinations. It could be something like puppies trying on sun hats under rainbows, or even as wild as rainbow puppies with rainbow sun hats. All of that information is then going to get passed on from there into the cogitation, which is where I mentioned the soul is kept. From there, it's going to make decisions about life and form a general worldview about how the world works. And if all your brain had to go off of were really cute puppies trying on sun hats under rainbows, well, you would probably think the world is a pretty nice place to be. That's how it worked in imagination theory. This idea of what one perceived through their senses in impacting their soul led early modern English people to become obsessed with all the ways that they could control what their body was influenced by. By consequence, sweet purses became incredibly helpful, as they were little bags that were ornately decorated with God's divine creations and filled with rich herbs and spices that would overwhelm the body to have more good images than bad images. Having sweet purses embroidered with these beautiful imagery and pleasant scents created that constant access. Because in the same way that if I told you when you opened up your FYP, and you're scrolling through those cute videos of little puppies, but they're mixed in with train crash footage and those insane people who jump out of airplanes without parachutes. Well, you did math. The world looks a little different, doesn't it? That's how it worked, to, according to imagination theory, that is. Additionally, if sweet purses didn't make it all the way to the soul and the cogitation, and they were dropped by the common sense ventricle, they would be filtered throughout the rest of the body by the humor of blood, which leads me to the second way that early modern English people understood influence, through humoral theory. Now, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> humoral theory is not where we get the saying, humor is the best medicine. As humoral theory was actually the idea that all humans had four humors, also known as the four fundamental fluids of the body, or the four appetites. And they were known as black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. While these humors dealt with influence on the soul, they were also part of the way that early modern English people understood disease. And they also believed that these humors were situated on two axes, hot to cold and wet to dry. See, black bile was characterized as being cold and dry, while yellow bile was hot and dry. Blood was considered hot and wet while phlegm was cold and wet. Appetizing, I know. In trying to reason out what causes these imbalances, early modern English people also believed that factors like location took part in balancing of these humors. And early modern English people believed that those born in England had perfectly balanced humors, which is super convenient, I guess, for everyone who lived in England. However, in life, there were several ways that one could become uncalibrated or ill, as disease was not understood in the same way that it is today. And rather than a belief in a bacterial or viral infection, it's just an imbalance caused in the humors. These imbalances could be related to one's location, diet, gender, or anything that one experienced by other senses, particularly their sense of smell. One way that humors could be recentered was by cons consuming and smelling sweet scents as part of a regimen. Now that I think about it, humoral theory was kind of like the early modern equivalent of your weird hippie aunt at Thanksgiving. She corners you at the dessert table and is like, hey, I heard you've been having some trouble with some migraines. I've been working on a new essential oil line that I think would work 
wonders for you. I'm gonna get you their card. Because depending on what was included in sweet purses could be an attempt at balancing one humor over another. Or if a combination of these scent profiles was used, a general balancing agent was believed to be the effect. For example, if someone had too much black bile, they were considered melancholic. And so sweetly scented things like rose, sage, or nutmeg could aid in this excess of black bile. If someone was choleric, meaning that they had too much yellow bile, they were encouraged to smell calming things like chamomile or lavender. In the case of being sanguine due to an excess of blood, one, be, one would be prescribed citrusy scents. And if they were phlegmatic due to an excess of phlegm, scents such as clove, mint, and rosemary could aid in the excess. We can even see these ideas carried on in modern marketing as women of the early modern period were considered cold and wet and therefore should smell sweetly scented things like rose or jasmine. And men of the early modern period were considered cold or hot and dry and should use more clove and minty scents to be recentered. In many cases, sweet purses would be made with a variety of these profiles in order to create that nice general centering effect, kind of like a Flintstone multivitamin. They also had ways of opening and closing these bags so the contents could be refreshed or changed out according to the needs of their owner. All of these principles that I've talked about became driving forces in the lives of early modern English people. In order to respect values in mod of modesty and charity in post-Reformation theology, but also allow for an investment in ideas of science and culture, Elizabeth I enacted some pretty specific sumptuary laws. Now, some tray laws are rules surrounding clothing or the consumption of goods, typically rooted on moral things like modesty. These laws are not unique to Elizabethan rule and had been seen in England and elsewhere beforehand, but the laws at this time upheld strict ideas of post-Reformation modesty within Elizabethan court. These laws became most specific when it was discussing court members often dictating the type of fabric their clothes could be made out of, the colors they could wear, and they could become as even specific as to say the type of color, a type of fabric, a type of person could wear. For the general population, these laws were pretty broad, as to say the Cappers Act of 1570 that stated that all men above the age of six were required by law to own and wear a cap made of English wool. However, these laws could become as incredibly specific as a law passed during the time of Elizabeth that stated that the use of velvet in the form of dresses and coats was only to be worn by those in the nobility class ranking above baron or baroness, and that the use of crimson velvet was even more strictly regulated as to say that only the maids of honor, also known as the wives of knights, were allowed to wear that in the form of dresses. If early modern English court could be boiled down to like a high school level environment, some tree laws were Elizabeth's way of saying that sweet purses are the equivalent of, on Wednesdays, we wear pink. In a space where extravagance and decadence were becoming incredibly restricted, sweet purses were permitted as they spoke on ideas of well-being and imagination theory and a thought for one's personal health in humoral theory. Additionally, these purses grew in popularity as gifts to be presented among court members, and they recentered themselves under the idea as they were seen as a gifts to be given with the intent of good health and divine nature. In the most obvious way possible, sweet purses sought to answer so many questions within Elizabethan court life. While we don't put much thought into our deodorant beyond making sure it smells good, that we use it every single morning, the history of what goes under our arms goes so far beyond its scent. And its origins are vital to conversations surrounding the religious and scientific beliefs and the culture of an early modern English person. In a way, the effect that sweet purses could mask the odor of an unwashed English court may have been an entirely unintended, but please believe me on this, a very, very welcome consequence 
in trying to answer this question of influence. The same way that the reason we can all mask our own odors and smell so lovely today, I might add, may have a little less to do with an awkward conversation you had with your mom at the start of puberty, and a little more to do with how early modern English people tried to understand the world around them. And that is how early modern science, religion, and culture made it to your armpits. Thank you. <laughs>